Hey everybody, it's me, Kurt. Oh, can you believe it? Oh, it's been so long. I've missed you all so much. Hey, so what are you guys up to? Oh, I just want to welcome you to this uh, wonderful interview I got to do with uh, a new friend of mine, Jack Plotnick. Uh, if you don't know him, you do know him. Trust me. He has 121 credits on the International Movie Database. You know him. You have seen him. You just may not know that you know him. So enjoy this interview. It is a one-parter, and uh, we had a lot of fun talking, and I just appreciate Jack uh, being willing to do this. So enjoy. Fantastic. How are you? Good, but I see now the screen is wider than I thought. I want to move something. Are we starting, by the way? Is this is this part of going to be what's going to be aired? I can zoom in on just me or zoom in on just you. So if you're moving around, I can, can just... Can I make out. curse words? Uh, yep. Not make them up, but utilize ones that have already been used? You can, you can even make up words. I appreciate <laughs> that. You and I have never met in person, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, so. No, we... Uh, um, when I first discovered Girls Will Be Girls, it was in 2005. I was doing Chitty Chitty Bang Bang on Broadway and sharing my dress room, dressing room was Bill Ryle. And he looked oh. at me and he goes, he goes, you know, I know Jack, he's a friend of mine. And I was like, what? And so of course, you know, and so that started the, the mild stalking, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Bill was so kind. When I moved to New York, uh, I met him doing a show and he let me sleep on his floor for like months. He was so awesome. sweet. I That's love awesome. Bill. Um, well, we have so we have a lot in common in that I'm f fucking obsessed with Walt Disney World and Christmas as well. Oh, I love it. So, <laughs> yeah. Do you know Voctiv? Yeah, I love Voctiv. The, it, it's just such a pure, fucking beautiful sound. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, we got a new album coming out. Liz Calloway's singing on it. We just announced that today. She's singing oh. When Somebody Loved Me from Toy Story 2. Yeah, so excited. I, I've been fortunate enough to be friends with Seth Rodetsky, so I've gone on a bunch of his cruises with Liz, and, and she's the kindest person, oh, and I've gotten yeah. to see her sing that. And um, She and I did, when I, my first Broadway show I ever did was Cats, and when I got into Cats, Liz was my Grizabella. So it's like, yeah, exactly. Right? No, I'm just I'm, like, you have to be a really good dancer to do cats. No, and I couldn't walk for two days after I auditioned for cats. I'm a 200, so. I was 260 pounds when I auditioned for that show. And they're like, hey, you'd be a great old Deuteronomy understudy. <laughs> so, where did you I, do it? In New York on Broadway. It was wow. the last two years it was open until it closed. I was in the final, the final cast of the first go around. What haven't you done? Well, that's I'm about so it for Broadway. I'm jealous that you're. The, the, no. Your Disney stuff makes me so angry and jealous. I just cannot believe that your voice lives in the park. But enough about me. We're not here to talk about me, Jack Plotnick. <laughs> I got to talk about you. This is your, God, your career, man. It's, it's crazy. And when I told some of my friends that you had agreed to, to do this, um, my best friend Clayton was like, he was freaking out because he and I both are just, you know, huge fan, fans of all your work, not just Girls Will Be Girls. So I'm not just going to talk about that. It's like all your work, you're just, you're this freaky chameleon. But on top of that, what I love about you is that you inspire me to want to create funny things or interesting things. Awesome. Because you're always posting stuff on social media. And it's this, it's these amazing, weird, off the wall, very left of center, for the most part, characters, which is what I relate to the most. I think I'm like a year older. I'm like a year and a half older than you. Okay. And so- You don't I, that's look like, it. Well, <laughs> well, we both look, we both look 20. <laughs> yeah, I started doing comedy shorts just as a way to stay active and, and to be productive and, and, and to put stuff out there into the universe that I love. And uh, it's been a wonderful thing. I didn't, I, I didn't expect that I was going to do so many. <laughs> like yeah. it was just something that came out of a desire to not sit around and get depressed. You know, like right. I, I love creating content now, and it's kind of a gift to myself. And then when people 
respond to it and they really like it. That's just so fun for me. Right. Or were you always like this as a kid? Were you always, were you an actor child and were you a child actor or were you just creative and had a lot of I was of in time? Ohio. I didn't even discover, I didn't know that there was theater until sixth grade when yeah. the high school did Oklahoma and we, we, they brought us all to see it. And I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. And then, uh, so I discovered theater in sixth grade, but I was always wanting to perform at, based on the TV I was watching, Carol Burnett show and Sunday Night Live. And gotcha. in fifth grade, I would, I can't believe they did this. They would, I, they would stop all the fifth grade classes and go into a room and watch me and my friend do like a, like a Sunday Night Live sketch. Wow. I don't know why they allowed that. But anyway, so I always like wanted to perform, but I really didn't know what it was. And then I discovered theater and I thought I was going to do that because that's all I knew in Ohio was like, you know, my community theater and stuff. And then, uh, and then shortly after graduating college with the BFA in musical theater, as I said, I, I auditioned for Cats. Like I didn't know what I was going to do, but I could not dance that well right and then I discovered TV and film I kind of really lucked into it and that's really you know my first love because I grew up in Ohio watching Carol Burnett and where in Ohio Columbus Ohio Columbus and where did you go to college uh, Carnegie Mellon University oh yeah. <laughs> a, little, a little school you might have heard of <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fantastic and you studied theater in school and and you were like okay this is what I'm gonna do and I thought it was yeah but you know, when I went, I learned a lot of great things there. But uh, and you know, they train you so that you could leave the school and do a Shakespeare play. I think I did a single one in my life, so at least that was worth the four years and the eight thousand hundred dollars. But I don't really want to do Shakespeare ever again, so that's fine that I didn't. That I didn't. I still now feel like I'm trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. And it just keeps changing. Like every few years, something different comes along and I'm like, Oh, let me try that. So you, you graduated from school. You, what were you doing right after you graduated? Were you, did you stay in Ohio? Did you move to New York? Was that, you know, Oh, I moved right to New York. Yeah. 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 And I, I did a children's show that summer after college in, in Manhattan. Right. And then I did an off Broadway show. That was, that's where I discovered drag was, um, I, an opera way hit, a hit show called pageant. I was the only understudy for the six men that all played women in a be in a fake beauty pageant parody. Right. Is that the That's one where the audience? My best friend Seth Rudetsky. Okay. He was playing the piano for it. I was totally going to ask how you and Seth met. Is that the show where the audience picks the winner oh. and it sort of improvised? Yeah. They're like, you have a, there's a different ending depending on who the audience. Yeah. Picks kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So you it's so funny because four years of conservatory training and they're teaching me how to be, how to play any role and be more masculine and um, get rid of all my idiosyncrasies. And then the, like the first big job I book is to play every woman in the United States of America. <laughs> and like, it was just crazy, <laughs> but I got to, it was, it was wonderful. So that's where you met Seth. Cause I was going to ask you, cause this, this relationship you and he have just, it, it seems like you're just always, every time something big happens, it's like, oh, it's you and Seth. There's you and Seth together. You co-wrote this show and you did this thing. And it's uh, like- I'm so happy that we were able to get back together because we were comedy partners for a decade and we had a, a, a long running comedy show at, at, at Caroline's Comedy Club in Times Square. And, uh, but then, you know, we kind of like got involved in our own stuff and he became this huge, serious radio uh, star. Yeah. We're, and then so it was such a gift to, to come back together and write uh, our, our musical together that somehow made it to Broadway. Yeah. And for the people who don't know, Seth Rudetsky is the voice of Broadway, of the Broadway channel on the Sirius XM channel. So look it up if you have Sirius XM because I listen all America. the time. Yeah. And he's insane. Okay, so you were in New York and you were doing this oh. stuff. So what took you out to... Right. What, well, what, what happened was Seth and I started performing sketch comedy and then uh, and that just just had me in just the right place when an audition came up. Uh, my agent called me and said, there's a real weird weird role they're looking for in Conan O'Brien, late, late night Conan O'Brien show. Yeah. This was right at the beginning when he first started. Yeah. And I got the role. But I was just so primed to play this role of a deranged children's entertainer because it was very similar to a sketch Seth and I were doing in our show. Right. And uh, I did about eight or nine or 10 appearances on Conan O'Brien, which then put me in the right place to um, be considered for a role on an HBO pilot. 
uh, and I booked it. And uh, so three years after I moved to New York to do theater, I booked this role and they flew me to California. The show didn't go, it was uh, Bob Odenkirk and oh, Janine yeah. Garofalo. And um, I was replacing Andy Dick who wasn't available. And so I booked that role and that brought me to LA. And as I was flying to LA, I'll never forget, there was this couple behind me talking about a self-help book. And I was just like, I think, th I think I'm home. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm, that, that was really my thing when I was young and still is the spirituality yeah. and self-help. Yeah. And, and so I moved to LA uh, and, um, and started working pretty much immediately. Uh, thank God I uh, had some really wonderful um, guardian angels who were fans of mine from my sketch shows and stuff that, that helped me get an agent and get, start booking work here in LA. You know, talking to Paul Vogt the other day, it was very much so the make one contact and that person knows these four people and they, it's just, it's exponential how the, so in, on, you have so to be on. a good person to work with. People want, you want to make people want to work with you again. If you don't mind, I'm, cause you've 120, one credits on IMDb really crazy it's uh, you're I'm telling you but I'm just gonna may I go down the list and I'll stop if there's something like you're like oh that or you have a funny story or there's a thing but but Murphy Brown you were on an episode that was like the second thing on IMDb um, I didn't get to do a scene with her, but I did get the, Gary Marshall was in the scene with me, which was really exciting because he's fucking awesome. But no, I don't, yeah, that was, anyway, yeah. yeah I did, I was on a lot of really fascinating sets, Caroline in the City and yes. Seinfeld, and um, I really got to see some amazing things. The neat thing about Seinfeld is that, that Jerry Seinfeld went to every audition. Uh, even for like small roles, he was there. That's how on top of stuff he was. And I'll never forget that the day that I uh, shot Seinfeld, they said, Mr. Seinfeld would like to see you after you get your, your, they do your hair just to make sure that he approves. Right. I love that. I mean, that's why that show was so good and so consistent is that he cared. And, yeah. and he, cause I tell you that never happens. They're right. just like, oh, well, whatever. Like no, and, and the fact that Jerry was like so involved and so wanted to, to make sure that it was all in his vision and it's really incredible. Well, I feel like, and it's part of the brand, it's your name, the show is your name. So if it's <laughs> Seinfeld and you're Seinfeld, you're gonna make sure, especially somebody like me who's such a control freak, like I wanna make sure everything down to the last whatever is, is how I want it. Yeah. So and that's around kind of that, awesome. At the same time, the guy who plays Homer Simpson, Dan Castellaneta, yeah. he was in the waiting room uh, probably not the Seinfeld audition, but maybe one of those, because it was that casting office. And I never knew how to say his last name. And uh, I remember that he, he, he had a phone call. He, he starts to say his name on the phone call. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm going to finally know how to say his name. Right. And he goes, it, it's, hey, it's Dan Castellaneta. <laughs> so he screwed up his own name. He even screwed up his, like, that's how hard his name is to say. He couldn't say it. Well, you should say it like he always did. This is, hi, have you ever heard of Dan Castellaneta? Neta. <laughs> the voice of Homer Simpson. You were on The Way in Brothers. Yeah, TV show. Do, they, they, it went so well, they had me, my character back for a second episode. I remember when I was meeting uh, Sean uh, at the first table read, he was like, hey, uh, he was saying hi, and he, his arm started to go towards mine, and so I went like this, but he was doing one of these, and so that happened, <laughs> and I was just mortified. I just felt incredibly uncool. It was just laugh. awkward. I was far too awkward to laugh with at that moment oh. in my life. Right, because you think everything is detrimental to your career. Every single mishap is going to ruin your career. I get it. So. <laughs> I just okay. wanted to be cool. Uh, and the Weird Al? Show you were on the weird, weird oh my God, he's so nice. He's one of those, he's one of like the people so nice that you remember for the rest of your life. You go, This is like the nicest person, a celebrity I've ever met. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, him, um, Martin Sheen, oh my god, wow. Jerry O'Connell, Rebecca Romain Stamus, Renee Zellweger. These are some of the actors that are go so far beyond. That just uh, that you're just like oh my god they're so nice. <laughs> Are you starstruck? Do you get starstruck by people like by celebrities? Oh Are my you? god, yeah! I got to meet. There's two celebrities I'd fall down and just start like shaking if I met them, and I got to meet one of them, Carol Burnett, uh, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, and um, and the other's Meryl Streep. Okay, so the first thing I knew you from that I didn't know I knew you from until I went back and started looking at your career was Gods and Monsters. 
Brendan Fraser, e, Sir Ian McClellan, K McKellen, McKellen, <laughs> Castellaneta. Right. Um, how did that, was that just a, you went and auditioned and your agent? Well, said, hey, we got I, I, it's a lesson that you just gotta like do what you love for the love of it because the only reason I got that movie was um, nothing really happened in my career for about a year. And then I start, and I went to see a therapist because I think it's really important at times of darkness, like seek help. And, yeah. and, and, you know, she helped me and I was happy again. She said, she was like, you know, do what you love, you know? And, and I, what I loved is like throwing a wig on and doing a comedy sketch, you know? Yeah. So I was uh, doing that. And, um, my, my pal Dennis Hensley's birthday, he asked me if I would do like, a, um, play this woman character I played in my sketch show. And so we put together an hour long sketch of me. And this was where Evie Harris was born. Anyway, so we did an hour long show where I was Evie and, and I fell down a flight of stairs and all this stuff. Anyway, so the, the, the director, writer of that movie happened to be a, a new Dennis. Right. And he was like, this guy's funny. And he brought me in. And so within a year, I was in Ian McKellen's Oscar clip because I performed in drag in the basement of some crappy Mexican restaurant. And, so, and that's happened a lot in my career when, and I recommend it to actors, like when you're doing your art for the selfish love of it, the universe sends gifts, you know? It, it, you, it, 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 you become a magnet for work versus when you worry about that next job and, and you know, anyway, so. No, so that's how I got that role, yeah. And Ian McKellen was, I mean, to get a front row seat to watch a man give an Oscar nominated performance is really a, an incredible experience. And also wonderful to see that he took the whole thing not seriously at all, even though it was a, a very serious performance. He yeah. was just so joyful and silly in between take. He doesn't torture himself with the performance or feel like he has to stay in character all the time, which is fine if you do, but I just, you know, I, I recommend to actors to remember you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> right, right? You guys, Gods and Monsters, if you've seen it, go back and watch it because A, it's a brilliant movie. It's such a brilliantly wonderful movie, but then you're seeing that scene is just so... Like, it was a movie that was very low budget and, and so like you only got about like two takes and I, I'll never forget, it was like the hottest day of the summer and we were out there and Ian had done his close up and it was my turn to do mine and I was not good uh, right. in take one. And the director was like, Jack, that wasn't so good and you only, you, we can only do like one more take. And you know, you, you have those moments in your life where I just, I remember looking over and one of the crew guys was passed out on his equipment, it was so hot. Oh. And I thought, Jack, like this is the moment, like, you know, uh, you steal yourself, like, like deliver, like this is it. Yeah. And, and, and so what you see in the movie is like that, that, that second take and then we moved on and um, it, it was an incredible opportunity. And the movie was never expected to do as well as it did. And when the director showed it at Sundance, his agent dropped him after watching it. That's how little they thought of the movie. And then of course it was nominated for an Oscar. Oh my gosh, I, it's, it's, that's so, that just is unbelievable to me. Cause it's, I, it's, it's a beautiful movie. It's so, a, yeah, Lynn Redgrave has a really emotional scene in that movie where she finds his dead body. Yes. And they had a lot of airplanes going over during the shooting of it because it was low budget and they couldn't do a lot of takes. Anyway, point is they were like, um, Lynn, you have to, um, uh, redo your dialogue in that scene. And I'll never forget, she was so upset and hurt that she, you know, she's crying in the scene. And so uh, she went in and did her voiceover before me. And it's great. She matched it beautifully and the emotion is there in her voice. Yeah. But if you watch that scene, she was devastated to have to do, to um, loop it. So then Ellen, you were on Ellen, like mm -hmm. the original Ellen, you were on like the last three seasons, I think. Of that? Um, no, I wasn't. I wasn't in the final season, just the first episode. I was in the three before that. No, okay. the two before that, I think. Okay. They brought. They, they needed a, someone to play a boyfriend to that very funny uh, character of Peter, who's played by Patrick Bristow. Yeah. Right. To me, that would be surreal. Like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I was in that. I can't believe. And again, I only got that part because I was doing my stupid comedy show, and and the casting director happened to come and and that's why she thought of me for the role but it was the second role i auditioned for on the show so thank god i didn't book the first right but i got to do a lot of episodes of that at a very young age i got to see so much of what happens in hollywood because of that show and i was in 
I don't know, if I happen to have this out. This is the puppy episode. Oh. This is the shooting script for her coming out episode. And I got to be there and I got to be in it. And I was there for the bomb threat. We uh, were told to exit the studio and Laura Dern and I uh, were standing next to each other in the parking lot, not knowing if the studio was about to explode. Anyway, yeah, I happened to have this in my storage space and I took it out because I've got to do something with this. I've got to auction it off. I have three copies. And Ellen pulled Patrick and I aside because we were the two gay people on the show. And she said, uh, I'm going to come out uh, in an episode coming up. And we were just like, oh, my God. And she had to get, you know, permission from the, all the people at the top. And they gave it to her. But she had been hinting that her character was gay for oh. the whole season leading yeah. up to it. I can't believe I'm, I don't have a line in, in the episode, but I, I can't believe I got to be there. I, I almost bumped into Oprah Winfrey because you know, I didn't see her coming. So I, it was an incredible thing to get to witness yeah, and, and to get to learn from Patrick Bristow. He's a genius and it was great. Have you worked with him since? Oh, no, we haven't worked together, but we, we stay in touch and we've done improv together at the Groundlings. Oh, that's fun. That's yeah, fun. his God. brain. There was something called Ground Control. There was a movie. Am I not allowed to talk about ground control? No, I just, I mean, no, I don't even know what happened to it. All I know is I got to work with Henry Winkler, who again yeah, know, is right? one of the nicest people. You go like, wow, like the Fonz, is that nice? Yeah. He was lovely, oh. And what I love about it is that you didn't say, Kiefer Sutherland, uh, oh my gosh, uh, who is it? Bruce McGill, Kelly, Kelly McGill, <laughs> Well, Martin Cho, Charles yeah. Fleischer. There's like all these people that I love, especially voice actors like Charles Fleischer. I'm like, oh my God, you know? yeah. Well, the thing was, I was only in scenes with Henry. Thank God I, I was his assistant in the film. I was like his weird dumb. But yeah, I have a photo, a Polaroid of me with him and I treasure it. Oh, I love it. I love it. You were in Buffy, the freaking vampire slayer. And you know what's not fair? I was on that show before I became a rabid fan of it. So there I am like walking around Sunnydale. It's all being wasted on me because I really didn't know the show that well when I got it. It wasn't until later that I, I, now I, it's on my top three series of ever favorite yeah. show. But um, that was a, an incredible experience to get to be. And I got to be um, the, ver the only, maybe, only human killed by a slayer. <sighs> See, what was your character? You were like the vice. I was the deputy mayor. I was the, the toady to the big villain of that season. And then Buffy um, kills me by mistake with Faith. And Joss Whedon was on set that day. And I, I, I was so proud because he said, good death. Huh? <laughs> drunk and death are the two things I think would be hardest to play. Playing drunk I, mm, playing and dying. I'm like... I, you know, what do you do? Well, if there's blood, you know, the blood kind of does it for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just quit moving. That's how you let play the, death. Stop moving and let the blood do the work. I had a really bloody death in Supernatural. That was my favorite. Oh, really? Death. Really? Because I got to, to stab myself in the neck with a pencil and blood is pouring out. That was a great, that was a really fun death. I would love stuff like that. I would love to play scenes like that. The more the more mm. theatrical and special effects and makeup stuff that are involved, I think the more I would just get into it. And, and Yeah. It, so. Oh, it's, it was so fun. And I got to be staked on Buffy. And the interesting thing about that is this man comes up and he shows you that the stake is retractable. He says, don't worry, the stake is retractable. And then they, they say action and you get stabbed with the stake. It fucking hurts. It's still a stake. Yeah, it's still solid. <laughs> oh, you didn't die, but it hurt. <laughs> Enjoy that bruise, that little steak-shaped bruise you're going to have over your heart and your ribcage for a month. Mystery men. Yeah. yeah. Amazing co comedians in the, uh, Hank Azaria. That and, was, that was the first time I got to work in a scene with Ben Stiller. And the second time I was um, Meet the Fockers. Yeah. And it was a very short scene. But at the end of the scene, I have to toss him keys. Right. And, you know, he's in a close-up. I'm off camera for the, this is the last thing I'm going to do on set. It's early in shooting of the film. Anyway, so I have to throw keys at his face. And if he misses, I'm going to be like in big trouble because I just destroyed the face of the man who's like on day four of a three-month shoot. Right. It was terrible. Why didn't they give you rubber keys? If you're going to throw them at his face, it seems like they'd have prop keys or something to throw. I don't know. All I know <laughs> is I was terrified that I would just somehow throw it too hard or just to the left. and. Yeah, that was scary. You forever have a scar. Yes, if I gave him that scar. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, thank you. I don't need to, no. The TV show action. I was in love with that series and I was devastated when it was taken oh, off the air. And I feel too. like that was, writer, was that writer's strike something? Cause it was short, it was very short lived or was it just, I feel like that kind of writing might've been ahead of its time. It, like I feel like if that show was on now, people have that quicker, shorter attention span. So they take in the quicker clips and it was just, Jane yeah, you know, HBO wanted it. And unfortunately, the creator of the show went with Fox. And Fox, if a show doesn't hit it big, they don't keep it running and, yeah. and give it time to build an audience. And so it was canceled. And um, this is such a crazy story. I don't mean to name drop, but I, I only bumped into Joel Silver because I was with Seth, who was friends with a man who's friends with Joel Silver. So anyway... <laughs> He goes, you know, uh, uh, we, if it had been at HBO, it, it would have run for years and years. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Oh. That's what you want to hear. Thank you. Oh my gosh, really? Thanks. That makes because I love that show. I love that show. It was so naughty and funny and yeah. Jay Moore and Ileana Douglas were so good in it. Yes. Um, and I was playing, getting, I got to play a great role that was a gay character, yeah. but, but such an interesting uh, villainous person. <laughs> yes. And so, yeah. You were in Dawson's Creek, you were in an episode, which I love the episode because it's separate ways, worlds apart, which Journey's like my favorite band ever. So that fact that your episode was named separate ways, oh. worlds apart, I love that. Well, two uh, things about that. One is anyone who does that show gets flown to the most adorable little tiny town in North Carolina. And it's just like a beautiful place to just stay. And a tiny little town like, like what's that, Opie and um, Andy oh, Griffith. Yeah, but maybe. anyway, the point is, um, when I did my scene, I had to do it with, what's his name? The uh, J James uh, Vanderbeek? No. Yes. What's his name? Yeah, James Am Vanderbeek. Am I saying his name right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Castellaneta. Castellaneta. Yes. And uh, anyway, so you'll see there's a scene, my first scene I shot with him is in a hallway that it's actually the last scene in the episode. And he's beautiful in real life, like more so than even on film. Like he's otherworldly beautiful. And when I watch that scene of me with him, if you watch my close up, just like you can just see in my oh, eyes and I'm just kind of like, you're beautiful. <laughs> Like, and it, I've, I've had that happen a few times in Hollywood. Like Jenny McCarthy was another person I worked with who was, you just felt like she must be an illusion. Like you could pass your hand right through her. It's just so beautiful. And then when I did my movie with Liv Tyler and Matt Bomer, Liv Tyler, who to, is, to me is like the most gorgeous creature on in God's heavens. She said when she did her scene with Matt Bomer, she couldn't focus because she thought he was so beautiful. Because <laughs> Matt Bomer is also very, very beautiful. Like the, anyway, but they're also all lovely people inside. Speaking of beautiful people, girls will be girls. Jack, this movie changed my life. I just have to let you know. Oh. It, it, to me, to this day, it is the funniest, hands down, the funniest movie I've ever seen. Like hands down, it is the reason that I have girls will be girls parties. It is the reason that. I, if I bring, if I see you do anything and somebody goes, who's that? I'm like, oh my God, girl, like, I, I, <laughs> we go to that. The fact that Evie was a character that you had invented just randomly years ago, you needed this, she's a 1970s made for TV movie. Washed up, washed up, yeah. like alcoholic. And, and you know, because I know you and I were raised in all those movies, the airport and, and Towering Inferno and Poseidon Adventure. So I just feel like she was one of those. She was an asteroid. That was her character. That was the, the big movie for her. But to me, I watched that, the DVD, but one of my favorite things to do is to watch it with the commentary on. Oh, wow. It is like watching a completely different movie because you get all the behind the scene stuff of here's where they, they take gels on my front door to make it look like it was multicolored. You can see the scotch tape or you can see the, where the hem on the sheet was just. A well, curtain. it was just made by like three friends and then, and then all these people who gathered around us to, to help. But you know, I, uh, the night before we started shooting, I was in Richard Day's house hammering wood paneling to yeah. his, the, his living room walls. Like it was really just made for, uh, out of love, completely homemade outside the system with very little money and um so it just shows you you don't need a lot of money to make something that people will love it's like gods and monsters wasn't a huge financial investment but what a beautiful movie i feel like that comparing girls will be girls with gods and monsters um 
I just feel like there's so much heart in it, and the writing is spectacular. Is that Richard? Well, it's all about the writing. It's all the Richard Day wrote and directed it, and it's yeah, he's so smart, and the writing is so funny, and he he really was. I thought it was a, a stroke of brilliance to combine the three uh, characters: uh, Coco, Peru, Varla, Jean Merman, and Evie. Yes, I'll never forget. I was with him when he was when he came up with that. <laughs> we were at a, a gay bar and having a drink, and he was like, you know what? we should put all three of those characters together. And, and it, it, it was just, they all, the way they bounce off each other is really splendid, yeah. Had you been doing Evie over the years? Like, had she been a mainstay of like your, your go-to no. characters or anything? No, but remember I said, when I, I got a little depressed uh, in, in around 30, and then that's when I was like, you know what, I'm gonna just start doing things I wanna do. And then I started doing Evie more because uh, Coco Peru and I would host all of the, uh, uh, Battle for the Tiara shows. We did that about three or four years in a row. Yeah. But I wasn't doing it the way um, Coco does it. I wasn't touring as Evie. I was just kind of doing a comedy show here or there. Right. And it was fun to see like posters where you were just showing up as a special guest or blah, 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 because people yeah. just yeah. knew you. And I'm like, you know her. Like if you see the character, you know exactly who this person is. <laughs> like the washed oh, up awesome. seventh actress that still thinks she has so much to offer and the just drugs and alcohol, and that's just who she is. She's unapologetic, and she's a terrible person, but not really, but she kind of is a terrible person. And I just, I'm, I'm so addicted to terrible people, like on- Well, on Richard has a wicked sense of humor, and he, ha he has a Twitter account for Evie that he writes with just the cruelest, most wonderful, dark, dark jokes. And the one where you talked to- her back to, for the pandemic. I don't know if you yeah. saw, but I did about four oh, Evie yeah. videos. The one, yeah. children, the one where you're talking to children is probably my favorite where you- Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Sesame, the story when, when she did an episode of Sesame Street, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But those are all on my YouTube channel, if you're curious. Yeah. He's still working very hard on the sequel, and, and I think that it'll come out in 2021, uh, probably in like summer or fall. Oh, please. I was going to ask you, because it's Girls Will Be Girls 2012, and we've been waiting and waiting yeah. and waiting. Yeah, and never everything. has a movie had more obstacles come at it. Uh, uh, yeah. But, but yeah, he's, it's, I've seen the first third. It's hysterical and wonderful, and he's working very hard. He never stopped working hard on it. just had so many obstacles come up. Yeah. But it's and funny. Even the title is brilliant because Girls Will Be Girls, and there's not a single woman in the film that every woman is played by a man and yeah. supposing supposed to be a woman, not drag queens, but supposed to be a real woman. That Oh, and uh, the guy from Modern Family, what was his name that was in it? Was yeah, it? we discovered Eric Stone Street before yeah. America did. I know. Is yeah. it? I would like to be in Girls Will Be Girls 3, if that ever gets cast, just if you need a, a Rod Roddy type character Okey from uh, Price is <laughs> Right, you give me a holler. Um, so then, one of my, it's like one of my favorite movies, Down With Love, Renee Zellweger, you know, you played her male, like you were a secretary, you and Rachel Dratch, weren't you her assistants or yeah. something? Yeah, Sarah Paulson was in my scene as well. Yeah, that's what I mean, that's where I met Renee and was like, oh my God, she's so nice. But the the, the thing about that movie was that the they, were, they just, um, boy, the sets for that movie were astounding to look at. Like oh, sure. the design of that film is is just crazy. So I do love it. Yeah, somebody loved Doris Day Rock Hudson films. It is it's oh, really yeah. a love letter to those films. It even had Tony Randall in it. And the the way it's, the the cinematography of it, everything about it, I had heard or read that when uh, they're in a cab, cab scenes, all the video background was actually from old Doris Day movies whenever there was a oh, New York wow. scene. Yeah they, yeah, they took that actual footage from the streets. So it was very realistic to that era that it was, it was filmed in. And Mark Shaman did the, the music for it, the song for it, Down With Love, and uh, the, I think he did the whole soundtrack for the film, right? <sighs> Again, your life. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm skipping down. I hate skipping over things, it drives me crazy. You, um, you were on Joan of Arcadia, the TV series, Joan of Arcadia. Yeah, they, the guy playing the bookstore owner had to drop out, so they needed to replace him, and I, so I did about six episodes of that. Yeah, that was great. You produced and directed and starred in Love Spring International on Lifetime TV. It felt like maybe 50% of it was improvised. I don't know how that was done. Oh, no, it was all improvised. <laughs> that was kind of the thing. Reno 911. Like Reno 911. Executives one. thought like, like that was gonna be the next big thing, was to do all improv and then find it in the editing. And uh, and and again, like we just, you know, we, 
we cast Jane Lynch and Wendy McLennan Covey. Yes. Uh, right before they, you know, went, became the biggest things in, in America. Yes. And, and uh, again, you're ahead of your time, I think, was the problem maybe because I thought it was brilliant. I'm like, this concept of the show is just... I love this show. <sighs> yeah, and I love getting to be that character. That's one of... Uh, other than Evie, that's like my favorite character to play is that character of like, you know, like a... a a macho mustache kind of guy stuck in the late seventies. Right. Like I love being him. And right. so it was, a, it was a heaven to get to be him for a, that season. But, you know, you can watch that online. It's fun. Jennifer Cox who played Jan in the Brady Bunch movies is in it. Yes. That cast. It's like, it was an unbelievable cast. And I'm like, how, how again, how is this not still on or how did this not? Well, I think that Lifetime quickly realized they didn't want to get, they, they wanted to go back to just being uh, made for TV movies. And it, it, they, they, at that moment, thought they were going to be doing more comedy programming, and they decided that it wasn't their bag. You were on an episode of Ugly Betty, which was one of my, like, newly favorite shows, because I never watched it when it was on, but I've binged the entire series. On yeah, the I think I was on a very early episode of it. Yeah, that was a great job to get. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. That's just fun to say, you were on Ugly Betty. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then, okay, Reno 911, did Reno 911, the movie, come first, or did Reno 911? Oh, no, the series, yeah. I, I did, I'd done many, many episodes of that before the movie, and then I was cut from the movie, actually. They filmed my scene, and it's on the DVD, I guess, but um, okay. I was sick as a dog. I, I'm glad it was cut. I was so sick. It was like the worst day of a flu, and they were like, get in this Speedo and get into this pool. And I was shivering. It was just an, an unfortunate timing thing. Mm. But the, being on the series, you know, it was frustrating because I did the series they created right before Reno 911, the, the series that that gang created. I was on that as a series regular. It, uh, and uh, it didn't get picked up by Fox. Okay. And then their next show was Reno 911. So they were very kind to remember me and to let me be on that show many, many times. And oh I God. loved getting to be on the show. And I just did the the Quibi version. I brought they brought my character back for that. Uh, you're in the commercial. I, you're in the commercial. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're in the, the and that's reading Tom Lennon in the commercial for you know nine one one on Quibi. Yeah, I, like I love the guys. They are they are good, kind people, and they just love, love. They're so funny. Is there a scene? I know there is, and I know it's you. But if it's not you, I'm going to feel very embarrassed. But there's a scene where you play a boy in a hospital bed that tries to eat a dog. Well, what it is, is I'm a cop, I'm a young cop who's like on his first day on the job, Tom Lennon's character shoots in the head by mistake. Right. And so he visits me in the hospital and brings a doggy to me, which I then try to eat, which was a gag that I would do in my comedy shows. And then we did an episode where they bring him back to the office and they give him a play school phone so he can like pretend to work there. You really couldn't do that today, but it is very funny, but it's, oh it's so God. wrong. Well, and also you're the sex offender that has the sign in his yard for like, those are iconic characters. So you have to oh. know that, that when people know, if you said who that, people go, oh yeah, I remember that, that guy or that scene. They're like, what is your life? Jack Plotnik. That's what this should be called. What is your life, Jack Plotnik? <laughs> uh, drawn together. You were the voice of Xander. Xander Wifflebottom. Wifflebottom. And you were on the never ending quest. What was the? I'm on a never ending quest to save my girlfriend. Yeah, that was, that was my favorite show to be on because I was a huge fan of it while I was on it. So yeah. it really was thrilling for me. And how I got that was, they had a couple people that they had planned to play the role, but they weren't gay. And the way they were voicing the role, I don't know, it just wasn't working for them. Or maybe it was too cliche gay. And luckily, the boys who wrote Drawn Together had, had been assistants on action. So they knew me. So they brought me in. And so what I did was to create that role of Xander, I was like, okay, what do I have in my toolbox I can use? And there was a character I did in my sketch shows of like a teenage boy who's like doing like crank calls. Right. And there was also a character in my sketch show of like of um, a teenage girl who's like really unsure. So what I did was I would just bounce back and forth between those two voices and that's Xander. He's, he's, he's neither, but he's both of those voices. So it's like, it would go from the boy, you know, I'm Xander and I, and, uh, and you'll see it becomes the girl. It's like, I'm Xander. I'm on a never ending quest to save my girlfriend. So it's like, it's <laughs> the high school girl and the high school boy mixed together. 
so amazing. It, and it was such an off color, irreverent, beautiful show because I got every single thing they were going for and then yeah. some. So it was, it was really, I have, I have a sixth sense of humor. So what a joy. Oh. I wish they'd bring it back. I really do. Me too. Every voice on that show is someone who's done, who's also doing voices of other famous cartoon characters. Oh, but yeah. I was the only one. A movie called Wrong? Yeah, I did a film called Rubber with a, a French director that did very well. And he really liked me and he wrote the lead a role of his next movie for me. Yeah. I'll never forget when he called me and said, do you want to be the lead in my movie Wrong? And uh, it's just a movie about me. I've lost my dog and I'm looking for it. Yeah. It's, it's very it's very surreal. And William Fickner is in it, Bill Fickner, and he's amazing. And the movie Rubber that you were talking about? It probably has one of my favorite taglines. The tire becomes sentient. A tire starts rolling around the desert and comes alive and starts making people's heads blow up. Yes. I mean, what's not to love in that? Come on. That has it me all over that hit. Like it went to Cannes and people just, it's a lot of fun. It's so it's fun. Cool. All right, let's, uh, you were on The Mentalist, the TV series The Mentalist. I was very excited because I was one of the like 12 characters that might have been the big bad Red John. Right. And then they killed me in like the first episode of that season. So I was not Red John. You're like, thanks. You were Red Herring. Is yeah, that... definitely Red Herring. <laughs> so, all right. So now, Space Station 76. This movie came out, it was 2014. Um, you co-wrote and directed this movie. Was this your first time directing a film, a feature film? Yeah, yeah. So thank you for hiring Patrick Wilson. <laughs> yeah, he plays the, the closeted gay captain, and then Matt Bomer plays the sexually frustrated husband with a wife. So it was and, nice to like get yeah. to like- um, Throw in Liv Tyler while you're at it, Jack. Come on. Back at Liv Tyler, can't go wrong, Jerry O'Connell. Yeah, Matthew Morrison. Um, I, I'm obsessed with the future as we had imagined it in the 1970s. Yes. And so I sort of wanted to do a story about sub suburban ennui, uh, but set in space using sort of the outer space, this 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 isolated space station as a, a metaphor for what it's like to be in suburbia. Right. So it's kind of like a, a weird, darkly funny comedy uh, drama about like unhappy people in space in the future as we imagined it in the 70s. But I thought I'd, I, I wanted to share that it's on stars now. So like you can watch oh, it for free. It's on stars. And oh, fantastic. It's really my baby. I love it so much. And the performances are crazy good. Yeah. Is it a script that you had been sitting on for a while or did you just write it thinking, I want to write this and pitch it and see if I can... It was a live show that, that became sort of this underground, like little bit of a hit here in LA. We performed it many times in like the HBO workspace and in different places. And uh, it was created through improv here in my living room. And then uh, I uh, adapted it into a screenplay and it's a lot of the original show is, is there, but you know, we had to open it up and add more characters in order to make it a, a feature film. Right. But it got a great reviews, got a 67% on Rotten Tomatoes and right. uh, it's, it's my baby and I love it. That is but so I, You know, it's like, I grew up loving Star Wars, like Empire Strikes Back, I saw 15 times in theaters, so. Yeah. There's only a few movies like that ever that you're yeah. like, oh my gosh, it, it connects with me in a way. So a funny side story, Patrick Wilson, when I was finished doing Cats, I was moving out of my apartment and I was trying to find somebody to rent it. Um, he and Jennifer Love Hewitt came to my apartment to look at it. He ended up renting my apartment for me in New York. I didn't know who he was because he was coming to New York to do Full Monty. He was starring in Full Monty. So he was just coming to New York. I didn't know who Jennifer Love Hewitt was. I didn't know who Patrick Wilson. So when he's in there looking at my apartment, I'm like, are you in the business? And she looks at me and rolls her eyes like, you know, who are you? And he goes, yeah, I'm about to do Fulmani. And I was like, oh, good luck. I hope that goes well. I hope you have a good career. <laughs> well, he did. Yeah. <laughs> and he's so nice. He's so talented. And then like a really wonderful, beautiful miniseries, When We Rise. That, that cast list for that is like the length of my arm. Was it was it interesting to be a part of that? Was your part like, eh, I'm doing this scene? Was it another one like I'm the bus driver and talking to a girl and or was it like Well, I mean I it was a it was a very small part. I I played the the the, the gentleman who created the gay flag or so the the, yeah. the first big one and um but I you know I, I I it was an honor to be there. Like I felt we recreated, you know, a gay march there and and, and what's his name? Um 
Guy Pierce is like right, you know, a couple people away. And, yeah. and so it was really, uh, it was just felt like a huge honor. Like, I can't believe I'm getting to be the person who gets to play this, this man who was part of this incredibly important moment. Yeah. So I just felt honored. That's all. Yeah. Did you know in advance, like the cast list of, of people that were going to be involved in it or just? No, no. no. I just found out that Guy Pierce was going to be in my scenes and I, I love him. And yeah, me too. I was really, I just wanted to, you know, watch him and see how he approaches. He's kind of brilliant. And He's kind of brilliant. Yeah. And you are too. So I'm, yeah, it's just fantastic. For my nerdy friends, my geeky sci-fi friends, I have to say Z Nation. You were in Z Nation. Oh, yeah. It, I have friends that are like, what? He was in, yeah, because, you know, you did a couple episodes yeah. of that? You did like. I was in the whole final season. I was like the bad, not the bad guy, but in a way I was the bad guy of the last season. Like the the whole series ends with me shooting the lead. Yeah. Oh, I shouldn't give that away, but. Spoiler funny. alert, everybody dies. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, that was an incredible gig and very, very happy to have gotten it. And what a joy. Uh, and that was another job that the only reason I got it was because the casting person saw one of my really stupid comedy videos and he just went, oh yeah, Jack, I like Jack. So he brought me in and he, yeah. he told me, I never thought you were gonna get it. <laughs> so it was a nice feeling. It's unbelievable. It is so unbelievable to me. And speaking of unbelievable, you were, you're on Grace and Frankie. Yeah. Like all on Grace and Frankie with Lily Tomlin. I mean, come on, Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda, like, yeah. But Martin Sheen, he just like, I don't know, maybe because he played the president or something. You expect him to be sort of standoffish, but he's like, you want to ask him any question? You want to talk about apocalypse now? And you know, he arrives on set and he hugs everyone. Like, it, it was a joy to be get to be around him and to do so many episodes of that. I mean, I never thought when I booked that role that it was be more than one or two episodes. Um, but would they just kept doing musicals because he loved getting to perform in, in the musicals on the show. And uh, they really like, we really rehearsed those. They didn't half ass that shit. Like they, they treated it like we were performing the actual show for that number. I love it. But um, I only got to do one scene with um, Lily and uh, Jane. Uh, and uh, I'm just so glad I got that opportunity because uh, they, they, they were both so nice and it was, it was hard to breathe being near them because I love those two women so much. And nine to five, I mean, oh my God, just right? everything. Yeah. Right, you're like, hi icons. But there's an episode where my character has broken his leg and they were like, um, the director wants it to look really real. So he wants to put you in a real cast every day. And you know, and I, what am I gonna say? I'm like, Okay, right. <laughs> but I was just, you know, I'd arrive an hour early and they put me in a cast and all day I had to sit in the chair with a cast and it's not easy to pee when you're wearing a cast on oh your God. full leg cast. Oh leg, yeah. It was, it was, it was, they, well, they, you know, I, I have to give them props for, you know, wanting it to look and feel real because it right. was. <laughs> Is it Sam Waterston? Says, yes, I love him. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was looking it up. So if you saw my eyes cutting across. So yeah, yeah so most of your scenes were with him. But, uh, like, and Roger could, Bart, but you're like, you were with Roger Bard in that show too, which I love. I well, love Roger Bard played one of the leads in my Broadway musical, Disaster. I love Roger Bard. We yeah. love him. He is which, an incredible. How funny. how funny you should bring that up because that is our next topic there. Oh, uh, Jack Bartnick. <laughs> um, so not only have you had this illustrious film and TV career, but then all of a sudden, hey, there's a musical, Disaster, that you you co-wrote with Seth, is that right? Yeah. And Seth Rudetsky, it was on Broadway, right? For yeah, Broadway. yeah, it was off Broadway and then we got to move it to Broadway. And, and then, the cast was crazy. I mean, yeah. the cast of Broadway legends we got, like Faith Prince, Carrie yeah. Butler, Adam Pascal. Kevin Chamberlain, Kevin too. When I, when I lived in New York, I would always get called in for the roles that he, Kevin Chamberlain was, because I was a lot heavier. I was like 330 pounds when I was doing Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in 2005. But it, before that, I would get called in for all these roles that Kevin Chamberlain was playing, like Horton and, and Uncle Fester and all that. So they would always just call me in as like, you're a Kevin Chamberlain type. And I'm like, well, he's gonna get it, you know, I, or whatever, <laughs> I, you know. But anyway, I know he's a sweetheart. Everybody that knows him is a sweetheart, but this cast and the fact that Seth Rudetsky was in it, 
I, wa- I had to ask you, like, first of all, this is a musical that is based on the 1970s dis- disasters movies, correct? Yeah, it's like, it's like if every disaster movie happened in one show yeah. and all the songs are hit songs from the 70s that we used to forward the plot. Yes. Like, like we, we never changed a single word of the songs, but we made sure that every song is, is it's not like, oh, we're going to stop the story now and then everyone's going to sing Ring My Bell. It was like, we found way, I mean, that was, that was the fun of writing the show. It was like a puzzle where how can we make every lyric of, of Sky High actually work in the, in the plot and forward the story? It was, it was great fun to write in that way. And Seth is so funny. Like, all I have to do is sort of set it up and then he'll knock it down. Oh, yeah. You know, he, he, he is so funny. And, yeah. and um, it was great to get to use my love of musicals for something, which is, you know, I, I, I finally got to return to my musical theater roots and um, use what, all the shit I learned at, at Carnegie Mellon. Finally, see, after how many years, it finally paid off. You got a Broadway show with that. Yeah, we got... We got I think there's like 31 hit songs. I don't know how we did that. Uh, it start, it start, the show starts with Hot Stuff by Donna Summer. And every time they sing Hot Stuff, it has a different meaning to right. the character. It's, it's really fun. Is it a licensing nightmare to be able to use that many pop songs for a show? Or? Probably for our music licensor, sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> for, you know, but yeah, it was a nightmare a little bit when we lost the rights to some songs for Broadway. Yeah. That was heartbreaking, but the great thing was it ended up, those songs we put in to replace them, we ended up liking more. The song that the nun sings that she won an award for Off-Broadway was Signed, Sealed, Delivered, and we couldn't get it for Broadway, and she was devastated. We felt terrible. We didn't know what we were gonna do because we knew that was the big 11 o'clock number. And then we ended up coming up with doing um, Never Can Say Goodbye, and she was nominated for a Tony. So it was was great that it worked out in the end. So, so amazing. What is your life, Jack Plotnick? Again, what is your life? Jack Sometimes Plotnick. I have to wonder that myself. I, I was like, how did I, what steps did I skip that I'm suddenly directing a Broadway musical? But it, it, was, it was heaven and such a joy, joyful period for and, us. And on top of all that, you've been in how many commercials? Countless numbers of commercials. Countless. Like, like How do just, you know that? Where does it say that on... It doesn't. I just know your stuff. I like there's, there's a number of commercials. The most recent one that I remember seeing is there's zombies trying to break into your house, and you're sitting there on the couch just talking to your wife. Like, and I'm like, it's not even really a comedic role, other than it, it is played straight face and just you know, and you're blah blah blah. No, thanks for the cocoa and blah da da. And then you realize there's zombies trying to break into your your house or whatever. That was but, a very timely commercial. That came out right as the pandemic was starting. And all of a sudden you have a commercial about a couple who's like, we're just gonna stay inside and enjoy coffee while the world burns around us. It was kind of, it was yeah. weird. And they did three other commercials that I wasn't in, yeah. but that was the one that they aired, I think the most I would guess, cause um, I didn't see the other ones, but it really was so timely, it was weird. Yeah, it's gotten to the point now where when I see a character actor, especially on a commercial or a TV show, I go, there's Jack Platnick. And it's not you. Some Most of the time it is, but sometimes it's not. That's what I love about commercials. You're always somewhere new, always something crazy different is happening. Like that's really my favorite thing about acting yeah. is I like, I like how it's constantly changing. Yeah, I do love how vocal you are about human rights and in people's rights. I love that. It, it's, a, it's a testament to who you are as a person because I know your heart is big by the things that you post that aren't, when you posted a video just about if somebody's trying to talk to you about things you don't want to talk about, here are the ways to curtail yeah. that. And everybody was waiting for the punchline and there was no punchline because it was so serious. And everybody was like, I was waiting for the punchline. And I'm like, no, this is what makes it so beautiful is that It just shows that your heart is huge. The fact that you teach acting classes, like I I took so many things that I learned from you. I read your your, the book that you put out, like a free download, and I just read through it, and I was like, oh my god, I connect with so much of that. The angst that we as actors put ourselves through for no 
reason. Yeah, You're I teach an approach to acting that's based in love and all about getting out of your way and how to control your anxiety by controlling your thoughts. And so I, I, I wrote everything I teach, I wrote in a free book that's on my website. You can read it for free. And what's your website? Teach is there, which is my name, jackplonic.com. And you click on teacher. But the first third of the book is really for anybody because it's all about um, living without fear or being yeah. getting rid of and uh, never being nervous again. That video that you're talking about that I made recently, it was just a concept that improved my life so much and my relationship with my mom. And then recently um, really helped like basically save my friend's marriage. It's not a concept I made up. It's something I got from my studying of self-help. Right. Anyway, so I thought, you know, I don't want to leave earth without getting this on film because it could help other people and but yeah a, a lot of people were like where's the funny <laughs> but i was like i don't know maybe yeah. it's not all funny especially not right now well i know but you know but that's what i love about you is that just your your everything has such a, a truthful emotion behind it that you do and the funny stuff is ridiculously funny and the heartfelt stuff is truly heartfelt and the fact that you teach these classes all over the place and i think you just charge people like to help pay for the room it's like you're not really making well i do a i do a monthly lecture where all the money goes to the la gay and lesbian center but during the pandemic uh, I'm teaching weekly and uh, anyone can be part of the class. You can write to me on my website if you're an actor who'd like to be part of this class. But anyway, it's $25 and all that money is going to um, fair elections and for Democratic candidates. So all, I'm only raising money for charity right now during the, uh, pan, during the quarantine. That's fantastic. But normally when I do my class, I, I, I take the money, but it's very little because I don't have the heart to charge artists. Um, much money so because i teach as a hobby it's my way of giving back because i feel that the way i teach actually helps actors and it doesn't trap you in class like i tell actors if you come to one of my classes you're done like you got everything i teach and it's all in my book utilize it go out there make content make art create a theater company put up a play get out of class is my message i swear if people haven't seen your characters that you just you put out there and you just <laughs> ugly up your teeth you've swapped faces with people the guy in the parking lot at the mini mall who's hearing the sticks song <laughs> and you're you're i even i even asked you i think i even sent you a message like how are where are these effects what are you using to edit your videos because i was like this is awesome i bought a green screen it's it's over on the side of me right now i have a green screen in my house now because I was just so inspired to do like these, yes, yes. I would show you, but I don't want everybody to see. I don't want you to see behind the curtain. I want to continue to be the wizard. Um, okay. One other thing I want to touch before I let you go, and thank you. I know this has been a really long, a long chat. I appreciate it so much. You played Evie Harris. It was, uh, Alex Mappa did a yeah. benefit. Yeah, he was raising Evie. money for nurses and doctors. And yeah. he came up with that idea. He said, what if Evie is on the toilet but we don't know and then she sings and we start to realize it and i was like alex what's, this is the funniest thing i've ever heard it was like, so Evie, are you okay and because you can't tell she's in a bathroom right and then she all of a sudden she's got toilet paper in her hand she's like i'm fine i'm fine <laughs> <laughs> it is so <laughs> wrong on so many levels hey jack i love you well, i love what you guys do and i love getting to be here today thank you for having me i feel honored to well, I'm honored, uh, and you know I'm a huge fan, and just keep creating and keep doing the funny stuff. I'm going to keep you sharing with you if you keep making it, and uh, you inspire more people than you probably know. So thank you a lot. Oh, you're welcome, and thank you. I really appreciate that. That makes me very happy. Awesome. Okay, it was good talking to you, Jack. Okay? You too. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. All right, you too. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Kurt. It's Out of reach, down the block, on a beach Maybe tonight, maybe tonight Maybe tonight Take these for the ride, you huge cow!